Aloha and welcome to the Condo Insider uh, program for all condo owners, condo board members, and anyone interested in condos. And I'm your host today, Scott Shirley, and we have a very, very special guest with us today uh, joining us to talk about um, some of the issues that came up at the legislative update and some statistics that he worked on. I'd like to introduce Mr. Richard Emery. Well, I've been here before. <laughs> Help me understand, why is the seat hotter on this side of the table than where you're sitting? Well, I know we had to lower it so yeah. you, we would be well, on you the are same taller level. than I am. Yes, I know that. Well, since we don't know a lot about you, Richard, give us a little bit of your background. Well, briefly, I've been in the industry for 25 years. I was the uh, former general manager of a very large association management company, Managing Agent. I founded my own company in 1997, which... Uh, became the third largest uh, managing agent in Hawaii, and I sold it back on January 1, 2011. So I've been involved in the industry for 25 plus years in the legislature and industry issues and have en enjoyed it very much. Well, that's good to hear that you've enjoyed it very much. But I drink a lot. Yeah, well, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> well. Our program today is we wanted to talk about some of the issues that bubbled to the surface at the legislature. And both you and I attended many of the hearings uh, at the beginning of the year. And so we'll start off with what was going on at the legislature in regards to condos this year. Well, I think when we talked about this show today, uh, my suggestion was we talk about the facts regarding condominium disputes. Yes. Every year at the legislature, we get a small handful of people come down telling the legislatures that the sky is falling, that the board members don't know what they're doing, and they want to impose extreme changes in our laws to create a government official somewhat overseeing association management. And we go through that every single year. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. It's great to have all this unsubstantiated facts, but there are statistics out there that say what's really going on with dispute resolution. Well, I think you, both you and I agree that a lot of times a very small and vocal group of owners will go to the legislature and then the legislature is led to believe that this is a industry-wide problem within all the condos when in actuality a lot of times it isn't. You know, I think what happens is, and that's, that's true of our city council and rail and all sorts of things, a group of owners or people in Hawaii aren't happy with the decisions made by the elected officials. And so they want to have someone else who agrees with them come in and make the other side do what they want. You know, and uh, it doesn't quite work that way. Yeah. Well, I know one of the issues that came up, and, it, and this wasn't the first year it had come up, and you and I have mentioned this before, but there was this issue of creating something called an ombudsman. Yes, well... The word ombudsman comes from a Swedish word uh, from 1809, and, and it's actually ombuds, man. And we look at their Norse dictionary, it meant a representative. And that has kind of morphed today into a government official whose job is to advocate for the rights of the, of the other guy and to be able to influence outcome with regard to those decisions. Well, and I've seen other ombudsman programs in, in smaller organizations, um, not necessarily on the government level, but like, you know, a nonprofit group might have an ombudsman program. The realtors have ombudsman programs, but not to the scale that I think this wanted to go to. Well, one of the suggestions was to do away with all associations and all boards and have government run the uh, condominium associations in Hawaii. And, I frankly said, look, let's get the guy who planned the rail to do it because I, I've, I see government does a really good job <laughs> of planning these big expenses. But, you know, I'm not sure that people really understand what an ombudsman can do and what he can't mm -hmm. do because there are statutory and legal issues to suggest that some elected official is going to be able to turn, overturn the lawful rights of a board of directors just as factual. Well, exactly. And... Um, I believe, if memory serves me correct, which doesn't always, that the Attorney General's office even had something to say about the Ombudsman program. Yeah, I think you have to look at it this way. When you move in a condo, you have a declaration and government documents, they're all filed. 
you've agreed to follow those when you buy. Mm -hmm. And it defines governance, your responsibilities, and a bunch of other things. Well, it's a contract. And A, you can't have government passing laws to interfere with a private contract. Exactly. They can certainly pass laws to say you have to get three bids, you have to conduct an election this way, those types of neutral issues. But they can't interfere with the lawful business judgment of a board to make decisions. Then when you throw on top of that our Constitution, what the Attorney General said was, they can't take sides on a, on a dispute like this. Because where this ownership group may have a belief, and the board may have a different belief, they can't be at government taxpayer money being there to take the side of one side over the other side. So wanted to clarify one thing, though, because I think we had mentioned it last year in a show that you and I had done together. Um, this thing called the condo czar. This is different than the condo czar then, right? Well, in a way, the condo czar was a, the ombudsman. That was the language the, uh, the person introducing the bill used to uh, define it. Instead of an ombudsman, he called it the condo czar. But, you know, we have some history on this. There's five states out of 50 in the United States that have, quote, an ombudsman. I'm going to say ombudsman loosely because in a way, I think we as the Y already have an ombudsman, which I call RICO, Regulated mm -hmm. Industry Complaint Office. But the reality of it is there's five states with experience, and if you read the legislative reports that they have to file with the legislature each year, they say approximately 90% of all their effort is for unsubstantiated complaints by homeowners that they have no statute authority to do anything with. So you have a very expensive mechanism that really has very limited very strong limitations in scope, but the people advocating for this keep believing they can have this broad program where some independent government official yeah. can make their board go do what they want them to do. Well, I know at a recent seminar that I was hosting and you were one of the guest speakers, you had pointed out that you know these groups had wanted to get rid of bylaws and all that kind of stuff and have the government take over. And you looked at it as, instead of private property, it becomes government housing? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean we're, 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 you know, people don't seem to realize that the board members are owners. Yep. They have to pay the same fees and costs per their declaration as everybody else. They live there. They want to preserve their property. But in any type of decision-making process, you're going to have different people with different views. I don't want to spend the money. I do want to spend the money. All these issues come to surface, and I'm not so sure that government who has no stake in the results is better than the people who really have to live there and live with the results shouldn't be making these decisions. Exactly. Well, you had mentioned that we do have somewhat of an ombudsman program and their name is RICO. Yeah, we have the Regulated Industry Complaint Office and they have very limited authority under the statute now for condos. They primarily can force the production of documents, yeah. but they have very little authority beyond that, although they certainly have influence to create settlement on, on situations. So th to me, if we looked at our laws today and just purified them and gave RICO some more enforcement authority, you end up with no new government entity and no new government cost. You know, the, the five states that have them, their costs have gone from like a dollar every other year per unit to five dollars a month per unit. So there's a Jeez. cost to this that's extraordinary that's paid through maintenance fees. So maybe we're better off examining the laws, where we can make improvement, granting RICO some more authority than trying to start a whole new government organization. Well, you know, the other side of that coin too is, is look at how condominium heavy the state of Hawaii is, where the amount of home ownership in a condominium. How long do you think an ombudsman would have lasted? <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's just truth to that because you look at there's about 1,750 condominiums representing about 150,000 units. If there's three people per unit, which I don't know, that's 450,000 people in condos before you add homeowner associations and plan unit developments and other types of associations. So about half our population lives in some form of association. And I can tell you the politics of a condo are no different than the politics at the city council on the rail, or the, or the politics with regard to our state government with respect to uh, marijuana laws and things like that. It's just part of politics, and uh, I'm just not convinced 
that a few minority people professing certain data which aren't factual yeah. is something we should act on and change what we have today. And um, I think that's an important thing is the data that's provided. And fortunately, somebody like you who does go and research this in, in great detail will come up with the well, correct data. Well, let's never forget this. Kind of, I, I know having been a host, you're going to be going into a break sooner than later. The current <laughs> statute already provides for several mechanisms for dispute resolution if you're an owner. Yep. The original Condominium Act 514A provided for facilitative managing, uh, facilitative value, facilitative mediation and non-binding arbitration. Yeah. Non-binding arbitration was like arbitration, but at the end, if you didn't like it, you could say, I want to go to court instead, and you had to go to court. And, but there were certain penalties if you didn't get a better uh, award out of the thing. Facilitated management was like a kumbaya, some neutral person had everybody to agree, and everybody hard heads, and nobody ever agreed. So they passed Act 187, which was a value to mediation when you get retired judges going mm -hmm. in there, and it's paid for through the condo education fund. So the out-of-pocket cost for the associations about 175 bucks, and the out-of-pocket cost for the owners about 175 bucks. And so there are mechanisms now to look at how many disputes are there in this 400,000 people, and let's look at this from the point of view: what were the disputes about, and what was the success ratio? Yeah. And I actually was still on the Real Estate Commission when that bill went through, and it was based on adding a dollar per unit registration to pay for this new program. So the bill was passed, and then it took about a year and a half to get to the point where they could start having the evaluative yeah, correct. mediation. Correct. The evaluative mediation was passed in 2013. It became an application in September of 2015. They had to make rulemaking and bidding and all the things government goes through. And it's, a, it's a, quite a fine program, and certainly it's so new, it should be given a chance to see how it works out before we criticize and try to find alternate solutions. Exactly. So well, just in a recap, we have this ombudsman issue that's basically come up every year. Every year. And we do have, in both of our opinions actually, better options than an ombudsman program, plus programs that are less expensive. It's not going to cost as much as the rail uh, <laughs> and things like that. So, um, and of course, we also had the AG's Attorney General's office opinion that you can't basically get into the middle of a contract. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very complex matter that needs a lot of thought. But people say, my board didn't do this. I fact, remember one lady, and I'll say this because it's truthful, but who said she's on her board, but she can't get her board to do what she wants, so her husband committed suicide. Yeah, now, I was at one of those testimonies as well. And, and so you get these extreme positions. You know, the legislatures are smart people. They're, they're going to want more factual data. I mean, it's emotionally sounded great, but the, the reality of it is there's got to be more to it than that. You know, and so well, the other fortunate side of this is you and I both know some of the legislators that have been very active in these bills are also condo owners, live in condos, so they understand um, a lot of this and they know when some of this information is not quite right. Yeah, ironically, we've tried to get these various interest groups together before the legislator, and some just refuse to meet and look for ways to deal with the issues. They just have a very hardened position on what they want and why they want it. And uh, it makes it very difficult because then we have to spend hours at the legislature bringing facts in and yeah. experts and people to uh, try to give the legislature sufficient, reliable information to make a decision. Actually, you stop and think about it. Some of the um, testimony we've gone and submitted and heard, it's almost like being at a board meeting, isn't it? It is in a way. <laughs> And they're going to sit there and make a decision based on the information they have, which like a normal board would do. So we do have an investigatory um, ability through RICO. Um, and we now know that we have different forms of mediation that we can do, plus arbitration. Before we get into your data that we got to, though, we had a piece of legislation passed in regards to mediation. Well, there is, you know, because I think my data will deal with that more, more effectively 
uh, I can bring that up when we talk okay. about some of the results with respect to this. And, you know, because uh, uh, what I did was do an analysis of all the mediations from September 2015 when Act 187 became law through present to look at who caused it, what were the results, what were the issues, to try to give us some semblance because we should know if there are mediations, well, what are the hot topics? Yep. So. Well, I think about now we should take a quick break so you can catch your breath. Okay. And then when we come back, well, we'll talk about your statistics. Yeah, well, the seat's very hot, so yeah. <laughs> I need to stand up and rest. <laughs> Soto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, well, we're back. Welcome back to the Condo Insider, your program on condo issues for condo owners and condo um, boards. And also remember, we do have our hotline, so if you want to call 415-871-2474 to join in the conversation, again, that number is 415-871-2474. Our guest again is Mr. Richard Emery, who knows everything there is to know about condominium living. Well, that's I'd, why you don't live in one, correct? Well, I, I, own, I own a condo. Yeah. But the uh, reality of it is it means I'm getting old because I've had so much experience. <laughs> well, I don't want to use the word wisdom. I want to use experience. Remember the old saying, in order to become an old and wise, you have to have been young and stupid first. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> I might be old and stupid because I'm still in this business. But so uh, now you're going to walk us through... Uh, some of the statistics that you were able to come up with, and I know personally that you spent quite a bit of time putting this together. Well, it's in its early stages, but I kept getting all this data, all these problems and all these allegations and these anecdotal stories that may or may not have been exaggerated and said, well, you know, there's public records on this stuff. The Real Estate Commission puts out quarterly a uh, bulletin, and in the bulletin that lists all the mediations, both facilitative and evaluative, that have been filed and the results. So what I decided to do was take a look at this from a multitude of directions and put together the data from the period September 1, 2015 through uh, this last quarter, yep. which would be at that point is May 31, uh, 2017. So let's just kind of look at this and I have a slide here um, talking about mediations. Remember I said there's like four or 500,000 people living in mediations? Well, from September 1, 2015 to May 2017, there were only 91 mediations filed, which doesn't seem like a whole lot to me out of a half a million people. Half a million people, yeah. And then you looked at that, and 84% of them were filed, not surprisingly, by the owner against the board, and 16% were filed by the board against the owner. And I would just point out, by the way, that a law that's still in the legislature will be picked up next year, House Bill 1499, expands the mediations to be funded by the Real Estate Commission to include owner versus owner, owner versus management company. It broadens those disputes that can be paid for from the condo education fund. But you know, you look about it, how much, there's this, this big problem with a half a million people in our state, and in a period of time of, you know, about a year and a half, only 91 mediations were filed, or about one a week. It, it was kind of like, well, there aren't that many. So I think the next question is, you know, what kind of mediations were filed for? As I said earlier in the show, basically in mediations you have facilitative and evaluative. 
facilitative is a kumbaya, they get a neutral person, they try to get you both to agree, so it requires the agreement of both parties. Yeah. But the mediator cannot engage in his opinion or any type of uh, comments. The value of the mediation, which is a newer form of mediation, you have a person who can say what he's thinking. And it's done by an independent group of retired judges. And so you get a retired judge who's been on the bench, and he says, you know, if I was the judge and you pursued this, I would make you pay all their legal fees because that's not what your declaration says or that's not what the yeah. law says. You get a person who is independent with respect who can helpfully influence these so um, a proper result has occurred. And to me, that's my favorite part of the evaluative process, is that you do have somebody with knowledge and respect who can say something like that. Yeah, I think the slide that just came up was the second slide was, you know, that of the mediations we've had so far in this period of time, 63%, this is slide number two, were facilitative and 37% evaluative. And facilitated is about $50 a person. Uh, valued it was $175, the best paid by the condo education fund. But this doesn't surprise me only because evaluative is so new. Yes. If you look at more current trends, they're almost all going to evaluative mediation. Yeah. So I think it's just part of the, the data. Well, one of the things I notice that some people don't realize is was on your first slide you showed how many went to was owner versus board. But there was also a percentage that was board versus um, owner. Versus owner. 16%. So it, go, it does go both ways. Yeah. Well, we're encouraging boards uh, to use this process yes. when they have a dispute and not just stick their head in the sand and have people angry. People are entitled to a solution. But the key question has always been, well, how successful is the mediation? And so my slide number three, I'm helping our producer here. <laughs> um, basically says as follows, of these mediations, these 91, you ended up with 33% making an agreement, 33% yeah. withdrew with no agreement, then there was another 13% they refused, either the board or the owner refused to mediate, and then 20% um, there was no agreement with, uh, excuse me, um, they withdrew. I think I got those numbers quite, declined. Yeah. Yeah. So 13% declined, 13% um, withdrew. Now, it withdrew is interesting because of the fact if you get served with a mediation request, to withdraw it takes both parties to agree. Was that the catalyst? They said, we don't need to go to mediation. Let's sit down and talk about this ourselves and Good see if we can resolve it. So when you looked at the numbers, 33 agreed, 33 didn't agree, 13% withdrew the request, and 20%. So my next slide says, if you take into consideration the, the withdrawals, you had about 47, about half the mediations resulted in some type of resolution. 33% ended up with uh, no agreement, although I'd point out to you that none of those 33% resulted in litigation. So <laughs> the, the person who said, I'm not going to agree with you, but the judge said you'd have to pay all the legal fees, say, I'm not going to agree with you because they have a hard head and they don't want to agree, but it didn't result in any further activity. Interesting. And then 20% said that uh, they won't go. And this is where House Bill 832 comes into play, this current legislature. What it says is you as a board member, if you fail to go to a mediation or this non-binding arbitration, it may a beach, be a breach of your fiduciary duty. Yeah. And the reason they have it written that way is that that throws into the play whether your director and officer liability insurance will cover you if, in fact, you lose if you refuse to go to mediation or arbitration because there's going to be ultimate claims out of this. So the whole legislative idea behind it was only for mediation and arbitration. There were some earlier part of the bills that expanded this breach of fiduciary duty. That's such an easy thing to cure if you just go. If you just go. <laughs> you have a breach of fiduciary duty and your insurance is all in tax. So they're trying to take that 20% and get that to a form of, of, of resolution where they just refuse to go. So the, the next slide you're going to be talking about to me is the most interesting one because we heard some wild stories at the legislature of where the problems were and your statistics show that's not where the problems yeah, were. Yeah, well, I think it was interesting because you say, well, where is all this sky is falling and these problems <laughs> of a bad board? And you know, we, I tried to keep it simple and divide it into six categories. 
the six categories are number one, a repair to my own unit. That was the la largest number, 28%. So you're arguing that the, pi the pipe was blocked up by me and you're making me pay for it. It was really blocked up by the board or the association or some other owner. So 28% were unit repair issues with inside their unit. 22% was a house rule violation. I didn't violate the house rule. I think the fine's too excessive. Then you got into 14% were governing common area issues. You're not enforcing the parking rule. There's too much noise at the pool. You're not maintaining the fence. Equal to the unit repair was 28% were arguments that you didn't follow your own governing documents as a board. And 1% had to do with, uh, um, or 7% had to do with delinquencies, which are respect, um, something to do with uh, how you're trying to collect a delinquency, maybe a fine or a rule. And then 1% was failure to produce documents. So that's been kind of cleaning itself up. So, yep. you know, there's a wide variety of issues, but again, 28%, only 30 out of the 500,000 people in a year and a half was an argument the board wasn't following their governing documents. So it seems to me that all this sky is falling uh, isn't really applicable. And, and I think looking at your statistics, and you and I having talked about it before, we sort of expected the house rule to be a larger one, but it wasn't as large as we thought it was going to be. No, and the unit repair inside a unit is the logical yeah. one to make. It's, you, they're saying your pipe caused the backup, you have to pay for the whole thing, or you have an insurance proceeds, and how much of that's yours versus some other owners. Is, uh, I can understand that, but you know, mediation has been very successful in resolving those. So. No, I think the, those statistics that you've put together were, were fantastic, and they, especially with what the complaints were, were literally, in my opinion, the opposite of what was being said at the legislature. Right. And so we've now put yeah, I think there's things we can do to improve the law. I think just saying that, I'd say that always the owners have a dispute, go see your board first. I think yep. you can look at maybe in certain issues, giving RICO a little bit more authority so they can get more involved in some of the more serious issues. But generally speaking, the problems that's presented to the legislature aren't supported by the facts. Exactly, I think. So, again, I can't thank you enough for spending the time putting those statistics together, because you did have to go through a number of real estate commission bulletins, look at the mediations, what types they were, and how they resulted. And yeah, the big problem you face now is the producer's going to be angry with you because he wanted us to save five minutes for a new experimental yep. program, which we were unable to do because we planned we don't know when to shut they, up. They only no. told us that this morning, and <laughs> we planned the show down to the minute, so we apologize to the producer. Yes, we do. Um, well, you never know. They may not have us back again. Could be. You know, well, we quit every time we show up anyway. That's so. true. <laughs> well, again, um, our program was on the issues affecting condos in regards to mediation, arbitration, the different types of mediation, and some fascinating statistics that you. I'm thankful that you were able to provide. And um, again, thank you for being the I guest this time instead of the host. My pleasure. The seat's still hot. Yeah, is it still hot? It's been a week since I sat there, but I, I know you've got a lot to say about that. So, <laughs> again, thank you, Richard, for being our guest, and thank you for um, joining us here at the Condo Insider for all the information you ever wanted to know about being a condo owner, being on the board, or just condo living in general. And until next time, thank you again for joining us.